This is an interview regarding the Theatre Bazaar, in particular the segment I Love You, which has been directed by the wonderful Buddy G. Hello there, Buddy. Hi. Right, first of all, can you just tell us a little bit about what your segment's about? My segment is about the breakup of a marriage, and um, it's about the deterioration of a relationship and all the pain and trauma that's involved, and it also has an added element of uh, when one of the people is psychotically sick. Right. So, in terms of how gender works in it, could you talk a little bit about that, about how they kind of play off each other? I don't know. In some ways, it almost transcends gender. It's, it's really becomes power politics. It's, you know, I think everybody's had an experience where you're in a relationship with someone where you or they love you more than they, you know, one loves the other more than the other. And it's always a, it's a horrible position to be in because you feel so helpless. And this is really more about power, not so much the fact that one's a woman, one's a man. I mean, it's a, it's a straight marriage, but it's really much more the power. And it's also about secrecy and truth. Uh, you know, they live their lives, in my story, they're living for five years married, but they've never really had a truthful conversation with each other. They were always living on the surface, and what was bubbling underneath was just never spoken about. And after five years, on both sides, nobody was happy. But the one guy, the husband in this case, who was just so completely obsessed with the wife, is prepared to live that way. He would rather live unhappily but be with this woman rather than try something new and find happiness. Or just even just to tell her the truth. And, and, and the reverse is true. She doesn't, want, she, you know, she doesn't tell him the truth. It's easier just to live her life every day and try to make it through. What is it that you think brings it to a head? I just think that after a while, in any situation, the one reasonable person in a, in a relationship can't take any more. It's, it's, it's damaging to live unhappily for years and years and years. It's damaging to everybody around you. And sometimes you get used to the damage. And the damage is comfortable because it's an everyday existence that you're used to. And you're afraid of change. And in my story, the woman, finally, after five years, has just, she can't live that way anymore. It was living in a prison for her. And she just, she had to make the change, whereas her husband wasn't prepared to make any change. He would stay the way he was. How do you feel about the ending, in the sense of, do you think it's a, a tragedy, a triumph, a mixture of both? It's, I would never call it a triumph. I think, you know, I think what's interesting about the ending is it's horrifically violent, mm -hmm. but it's also an act of love. In the in a way of you know the main character, the the husband who's not really looking at it as that he killed anyone or that he's even going to kill himself. He's looking at it as just, it's a way for them both to be together eternally. It's almost like what the wife says to him during the film. You know, I couldn't have a kid with you because I would have been chained to you forever. Mm -hmm. We'd have this this child between us, and you would be connected to me through this child. So that's why she had an abortion and wouldn't have a child with him. And this final act is his revenge, so to speak. Whereas, okay, I'm coming with you. You're not going to be alone. You're dead. But don't worry, honey, you won't be alone. I'm coming with you. That's really mega sweet. So <laughs> <laughs> did, you have, did you have any kind of different ideas that you maybe would have used in retrospect or any things you workshop maybe? Or? No, I wrote this exactly for Theatre Bazaar. I got a call a year ago in August, almost exactly to the day about this project. And they said, it's going to be very little money, but you could make whatever you want. There's no censorship. There's no other control. Nobody will tell you what to do. Final cut, final decision on cast, on everything. So for me, that was a tremendous advantage. I jumped at that chance. And then it was a question of what to do. And I read the other scripts. I came in last. Everybody else had already been approved and were on the project. So I read the other scripts, and I thought, wow, they're all so different, and they all seemed so ambitious. So I figured my strength has always been character and actors and trying to get the best performances I can. So I needed to do something that was going to be small and character-driven. Also, you know, I did my first feature 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. I don't have access to, to do everything for free anymore. You know, I got spoiled. I, I was making films with budgets. So I needed to do something that would be small that I knew I could do on the budget. So I wrote this story specifically for Theatre Bazaar. I had no plans or ideas. It wasn't a story I had sitting around for a while that I wanted to make. How do you feel it's developed you personally working on it? I think in some ways it's probably my most genre-friendly piece. Because uh, if you've seen my other work, you know that they're not really horror films. It's funny, I've always been, a f you know, I've always been accepted by the horror audience, but they also know my films aren't horror films. So I've almost been like the black sheep of the genre. So I think this is actually much more horror-oriented 
it's just because of the shock ending and because it's it's so strong and I think I think the most horror people to be honest I mean the acting in a lot of horror films is really bad and a horror audience is very forgiving you know they're willing to look beyond the bad acting because they want to see the effects and the violence and the, and the, the frights and the thrills and I think uh, one of the things they appreciate about my films is that they know that the actors were always going to be believable and in some ways sympathetic even when they're doing horrible things and I think that's something they don't generally get in most horror films. Out of interest, were you rooting for either character in particular or...? I go back and forth. In the script phase, she really came off as a bitch, you know, and I didn't see her as a bitch, but I knew that what she says to this guy is so brutal. What she says is as brutal as what he does at the end, in many ways. So I needed to cast somebody that was going to be completely believable, because once you believe her, then you say, okay, this guy deserves it. During the editing period, me and the editor, we were bouncing back and forth between thinking this guy's a loser and while she's a bitch, and by the end of the film, you think they're both right. You know, they both make their points. Women actually, 100% across the board, women come up to me and they say, you know, she's right. You know, we, you know, they say, like, we know that guy, even though they may not have been involved with a guy exactly like that, but they know what that's like to have some possessive stalker type of guy, either be a boyfriend or a husband or just be a guy that just keeps coming on to them. I think every woman can relate to, to that guy. At least that's what I've heard at the festivals I've been to with the film. They love Susan. They, they, they think Susan is, is, you know, Susan says everything that they probably <laughs> wanted to say for a long time. When, of course, you have the ending, do you have anything in particular that you'd like the audience to take away from the film? Other than just obviously kind of enjoying it in whatever way? You know, I just want to take them into a place where they'd never go. I would never want to see that in life. I would never want to know that guy or that couple in life. But the fact is, they do exist, and I think, you know, I want to take the audience into a place where they normally wouldn't go before. And I think the ending is such a shock, and I want the ending to be disgusting and shocking, and at the end of it all, you almost have to chuckle because it's so twisted. We understand violence when it's for robbery or revenge or jealousy or, you know, hatred, but, like, when the violence at the end is because of, out of misguided, obsessive, psychotic love, it's, I think it's something different, and I think that's what people would respond to when they see the film, is that the guy is so completely twisted, mm -hmm. and in a way, he's not a monster. No, I'll be honest, I thought it was absolutely, the end in particular, it was visually and emotionally beautiful. The, the last shot. Yeah. Is, uh, the last, the Susan is the most beautiful body I've ever seen, the most beautiful dead body I've ever seen. She, she's, she's got an amazing face, hasn't yeah. she? It's, it, I mean, was there any particular reason you went for that particular actress? I worked with her before in Germany, and she's basically known as doing romantic comedies. She doesn't really do ah. stuff like this, you know, and I, she's not respected as much as she should be. They look at her as a light-hearted actress, and when I worked with her, I saw she had a certain profound nature. She had a deepness, and I knew that she was an amazing actress, so I really wanted to work with her and cast her in something that gave her a chance to show something. She's German. She speaks French in the film. She's playing a French woman, but she is German, and her father was Persian, and her mother, I think, was German. So she has this r really weird mix that's beautiful. She does. It's strange because her face, she's perfect, but she's not, she's not Hollywood perfect. She's exactly. believable. <laughs> she's got a certain uh, classic beauty, and I really think it's the, it's the mixture. It's the mixture of the German-Persian blood that she has in her face, in her, in her body, in her mannerisms. And she speaks like, you know, four or five languages. She's a brilliant woman. How did you consider the way that the entire thing would look in terms of the way the characters move and, you know, interact with the scenery? Well, I wanted there to be two sections. I wanted the, the, the bedroom to be her, her world and the living room to be his world. That's why the bedroom is, is so white and we always frame her against windows. We purposely wanted to put her against like a white background and play her more as that's her world and she's married to a guy who lives in a closet. When we look at him, we're looking deep into the room. There are no windows behind him. It's, we're looking at the, against a brown wall. So I wanted to play with color. You know, imagine you got these two worlds that live next to each other. You got the bedroom, which is where she feels comfortable and it's light, and you got his little cave next door, and yet they both have to inhabit the same space. When he comes into the bedroom to confront her, it's really creepy. It's creepy visually because he doesn't belong there. You can see it. You can just see the color doesn't match with him, it doesn't fit his space. As far as the movements, it was just really prison. I was doing a prison movie in a way. These two people were trapped in a marriage that was a prison, and their, their apartment became a prison. Was there anything you took inspiration from? Hmm, that's a good question. What do, would I... You know, of course, the classic, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? With Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton. I mean, you know, they were the... the, the, the of course, that's the, the classic that comes to mind because it's a, such an incredible 
thing. I'm, I'm fascinated by marriage. I'm, I find marriage to be the most fascinating relationship two people could be involved in because it's so deep and it's so intense and there's so much involved and there's so much truth and secrecy and there's also sexuality that comes in and I'm always amazed like when how do two people come together you know especially when you're getting into fetishistic sex and you have that in a marriage like how does two people that have their own sexual secrets come together and how do they find each other so I that has nothing to do with this film but that's one of the things I'm always fascinated with with, with marriages is what's it like to open the door and look at this marriage when they're not in public and see the dynamics and the secrets and everything that's going on it's, it's the most fascinating thing to me do you have like a research process or do you just go from what you already have up in your head yeah I go from my life experience what I see I study my wife will tell you I'm just we go out, I melt into the background, and I just like to watch. I, I love people. I love to watch people and see how they interact. And, and so it's pretty much my imagination. I, I don't know how you would research such a thing. You know, because you could interview people about their marriage, but you're not really sure if that's, you know, you're never going to get the truth. Because I know if, if my wife was sitting here and you were asking me certain questions, I would think, like, before I say the absolute truth, would I be hurting her? Do I like her shoes as much as I said? I, you know, it could be anything. What kind of small details in particular did you bring to this particular segment in that respect? That's fascinating. Well, the ceiling. The ceiling is something that I, I laugh with my friends. See, that's every man's nightmare, to make love to your wife, and she's out. She checks out. And, and that's one of the things a lot of people in their marriage are afraid to discuss openly sexual things, which I think is wrong, because if you can't discuss that type of stuff with your wife, like, all this guy had to do, and think about it, she agrees to have make love with him one last time. Maybe if he wasn't so selfish, maybe if he made love to her the way she needed to be made love to, maybe she doesn't leave. You know, maybe. But the fact is he's so selfish during the sex act when she says, please fuck me harder. I need it harder. And he says, you know, you know don't ruin it for me, Mo. Yeah. And she, at that point, she realizes, I'm out. And then he could be fucking a chair at that point because he wasn't fucking his wife anymore. She wasn't there. And when she's staring up, she's an object the way that's, that wire in the ceiling is an object. And you see it. You see her face. She's just empty. So that's a detail that uh, I find horrifying. Mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I tell my friends, I've removed all the wires out of our ceilings. Where there's nothing on our ceilings in my home. <laughs> it's weird in that way. It's, the film's almost like a warning. It is. It is. And... He just, he couldn't hear her. He couldn't, he couldn't listen to what her needs were. It was, he was so selfish. And that's also the trigger for what she tells him in the living room. I think that because of that moment in bed, she says, okay, you want the truth? Here it comes, pal. And she lays it out. Is there anything you think she doesn't say at all, or is it all there? I think she exaggerates. I think that, I do think that she had sex with her brother-in-law. I do think that she had the abortion. Did she fuck everybody? I don't think so. Did she have so many one-night stands? I'm not sure if she did or not. You know, but the fact is he believes it. But I believe she had those... She had the, the abortion, I believe, and she did screw her, her sister's husband. Because when he says, I don't believe you, and she says, well, why do you think... My, my sister and I haven't talked since then. Of course, why wouldn't a sister talk with her other, you know, her sibling? Because of something that would be so fucked up. So that's the question that remains open. Does she say those things just to drive him away? Or does mm -hmm. she say them because they're real and they happened? Is there anything that didn't go in that, you know, if you'd have had maybe extra time, extra money, whatever, that could have gone in? No. There was one scene, there's only one scene that got cut out, and that is the end. She says, you know, I'm sorry, and she goes to pack up. We had a shot on him, another flashback, where he pretended to have a heart attack when she was about to leave. And she called the ambulance, and the guys come in, and, you know, he's about to die on the floor. And she said, don't worry, honey, I'll stay with you. I'll stay, honey, because he's big, he's dying. She says, please, Mo, don't leave me. And then when he comes back into the bedroom and he tells her, I just had a biopsy. But it was too long. It slowed down the film. It didn't work. And I felt once we cut that scene out, it still worked. You still got the idea that he was pretending to have this biopsy and to pr pretending to have cancer. And that was the only thing that didn't make it into the film. There's nothing else I would have added. I wish it was a feature, but it probably it could never work as a feature because it would be just too too intense. Because that intensity is its power, because it really does smite you between the eyes, and you just <laughs> it's it's very it's it's very strange to watch it because it's so beautiful at the end. You kind of think you had to stay together, and if that was the only way you could do it in some ways, it, it forces them into you know, that perspective. I guess 
in some ways they're both you know really twisted people yeah. and maybe they do deserve to be together in a certain way I mean she certainly doesn't deserve to be with that guy George the guy in the car I mean that guy's just he's just a way to get the hell out mm. I mean I don't see you know that he's not the right guy for her out of interest do you think that everybody has a chance of happiness or is it something that some people only maybe get a chance of I think everybody has a chance because what do you need to be happy you just need a good part like um, my thinking is you need to have a good partner you need to have something that you like to do and I think that's enough. If you have your health, I mean, of course, people that get sick and they get terminally, you know, terminal illness, of course, that's going to make you unhappy. But I think everybody has the chance to be happy. Yes, I don't think unhappiness is actually a bad thing. Unhappiness actually triggers a lot of art. I've done some of my best work when I was unhappy. I don't think unhappiness is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, yes, I think everybody can have happiness. It's interesting because obviously the, the backdrop is often so sad or so the world around seems to be so damn nihilistic and yet you've got this one kind of big, you've got this very strong emotion. Yeah. I mean, how do you see that kind of interplay going on? I think that love is a, an incredibly strong emotion. I think when it works out, you know, listen, the worst thing is when you love somebody who doesn't love you back. I mean, that's the worst and we've all experienced that. And maybe that's not really true love. But that feeling of, you know, you feel you desire somebody and you feel like you can have a life with somebody and they don't want you, I mean, that's a major point of unhappiness. The opposite is the reverse. I mean, when they love you and you love them, you know, it makes having a shitty job okay. It makes, you know, not having a lot of money okay. It makes so many things that when you're alone, miserable, it makes it okay. Absolutely. I thought it was great. Well, I thanks. sat and cried. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your time, buddy. You're welcome.